Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the May 30th, 2024 meeting of the City of Gloucester Zoning Board of Appeals. This meeting is a hybrid meeting, it will be held here in public. It's also available on Zoom, and the Zoom ID for tonight's meeting is 837-4781-9720. I recognize in attendance myself, Joe Parisi, um, Peter Canavo, James Gelati, and Ronald Wilson, and also zooming in, Michael Nyman. And I declare we have a quorum of five. The, uh, the people will be able to participate in the meeting if they're not in the hall by raising their hand on their app, and they'll be recognized during public testimony. Our first order of business tonight will be the approval of the minutes of May 9th, 2024. Are there any corrections or omissions? If not, I'll entertain a motion to approve. I make a motion to approve the minutes for May 9th. Second. Made and seconded. Roll call vote. Mr. Nyman? I was not present. Mr. Canava? Yes. Mr. Gelati? Yes. Mr. Wilson? Yes. Mr. Breezy? Yes. Minutes are approved. We had one continued application, and I believe we are in discussions about a continuance. The uh, petitioner, SS Sala Estate Investments, LLC, seeking a variance under 1.7 for a change of use and to construct a second principal structure, two-family home, on a lot at 12 to 18 Plum Street. Attorney Favazza. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Per the email I sent, we are still working with some of the concerned neighbors to make changes to the plans, and we'd like to request to be continued to the next available spot, which I believe is not your next meeting, but the meeting thereafter. Right. It will have to be June 27th. We have a motion to that effect? Um, I make a motion to continue uh, the State Investment LLC 12-18 uh, Plum Street to continue to June 27th. Second. Second. In second at roll call. Mr. Canavo? Yes. Mr. Gelati? Yes. Mr. Wilson? Yes. Nyman? Yes. Mr. Parisi? Yes. Okay, we'll Thank continue, you. continue that one to then. Our first new application of the night is the petitioner, Andrew Lee, seeking a special permit under 1.10 and 4.1.2 to allow a lesser number of off-street parking spaces at 5 Eastern Avenue. And, Andrew, on, here or on line? Is someone raising their hand? Hmm? Or raising their hand? Neither one. Let's see. Yeah, Lee Tree, that would be him. Let me bring that in. Hello. Yes. Hey, am I there? We can hear you. We'll need. Oh, you. great. Oh, First gosh. Thing. We're going to need your name and address, and then you're going to explain to us your project. Yeah. Uh, so my name is Andrew Lee. I live at Five Eastern Ave, um, right next door to Lee's Diner down here. Um, and I'm what I'm looking to do is become a two family. I'd, I'd like to be able to rent out the downstairs of my house. And uh, but I have only one parking spot. So I understand from reading um, your application, it has existed with a, a rental unit for a number of years. Well, I moved it. Yeah, it, it, it was it was a it was a. I moved in as a um, as a tenant in 1996, 
Um, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's been empty downstairs for, for some time, but there I've had, I, I have had people stay there, but, um, in the past, but, um, yeah, so I'm just looking to, uh, legitimize the downstairs as a, as a, as a two family. So our five two family matter of right to some degree, the parking is the, the only thing before us. Now you did, um, when you rented their main house was occupied. So it was a two family. Okay. Yes. Yeah, that's correct. Okay. Any questions of the board for the applicant? It, they're just um, asking for that relief. They're not changing the, the building footprint. Everything's staying the same. Everything's staying the same. Um, yeah, no, no construction necessary. Um, it's just that a second parking spot, would, it would be impossible to add. So it's the relief for the second spot that, um, that I'm asking for. That's correct. No changes to the exterior. Correct. And you're just going to start using it again. I'd like to start using it again as a two family. That's right. Okay. Any other questions by the board? No, I'm I'm just interested in hearing it uh, from neighbors, possibly. Okay, hey, we'll actually. Uh, no, not talking to you. Sorry. No, sorry. Yep. Let me uh, let's uh, let's go to public testimony. Is there anyone in the audience that wish to speak in favor of the application? Please come forward, and I remind everyone we need your name and address for the record. If no one is here and they wish to speak from remotely. You have to hit the raise hand button on your device, or if you're on a phone, you dial star nine for us to recognize you're out there. So we, anyone wishing to speak in favor? Hearing none. Is there anyone that would like to speak in opposition to the application? Again, come forward, or if you're on a device, raise your hand. Anyone wishing to speak in opposition? <sighs> seeing, seeing none, discussion by the board? Somebody raise their hand. Is what? No one in opposition. Okay, we'll close the public testimony. Any uh, discussion by the board? It seems uh, reasonable. I mean, build a two family by right. They just need a little relief for the parking and the hot chip. Peter, speaking to your mic, please, just so I can the hear you. Hot chip there is uh, the other size of the lot. Um, so I don't see an issue with it personally. Anybody else? No issues. No yeah. issue for me. Not a variance either. I mean, it does have tremendous hardships and shape and all, but it's basically a, a special permit to, to allow one space instead of two. So with that being said, anyone wish to make a motion on the application? Um, I make a motion to the petitioner, Andrew Lee, seeking special permit to allow a lesser number of off-street parking space. I, I don't believe it's more detrimental to the neighborhood. Um, I think it's a, a simple adjustment, so I approve. Second. The motion made and seconded. Issue a special permit to allow a lesser number of off-street parking spaces. Roll call vote. Mr. Gelati? Yes. Mr. Wilson? Yes. Mr. Nyman? Yes. Mr. Canavo? Yes. Mr. Parisa? Yes. You've heard our decisions favorable. We will draft the decision that will eventually make it to you, and then you'll be able to register it on, with the Registry of Deeds and go ahead with your project. Excellent. Well, thank you. Good luck. Okay, our second hearing is the petition of Marina. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yay. He should hang up his phone then. 1.9 and 2.3.4.3 to alter or expand a non-conforming residence on a non-conforming lot 
a special permit under 3.1.6 to exceed the maximum height of an accessory structure, a shed, and to amend a previously granted variance under 1.7.4 for side and front yard setbacks at 8 St. Louis Avenue. Attorney Favaza. Thank you very much. For the record, my name is Joel Favaza. I'm an attorney at Seaside Legal Solutions, 123 Main Street. I'm going to share my screen so we can go through a quick presentation. So uh, yeah, I'm here on behalf of Marina Bellier. She's the trustee owner and she's here tonight in the tan shirt. And she's the trustee owner of 8 St. Louis Avenue. And we are looking to add an addition over the existing garage to expand the second floor bedroom and add a bathroom. And also to replace an existing shed with a slightly larger shed that'll be uh, more aesthetically matched to the structure on the property. So we are in the RC40 district and this is a pre-existing non-conforming structure on a pre-existing non-conforming lot. As you can see from the yellow highlight, it's a pretty narrow lot. Um, it lacks lot area frontage width, and both side yard setbacks actually overlap. So there's like, a, there's like a negative building envelope on this property because the left side yard setback ends inside the right yard side uh, setback and vice versa. The existing shed and house therefore sit in a lot of the setbacks because there's no piece of the property that isn't in a setback. So we need a special permit to alter expand. Oh, there's a little typo there. Sorry about that, guys. Or on the alternative um, to amend an existing variance, and I'll talk about that in a second. And the shed needs an alter expand permit and a height permit also. So in 2007, an addition was put on to this house, and it was put on with a special permit and variances. And we went back through, and the lot was created in 1940. The structure was built in 1949. And so in 1982, the house became a pre-existing non-conforming structure. And so in 2007, they didn't really need variances to do what they did. This is even, though this is before the Diedrich case, even back then, you didn't need a variance. It seems like they got one out of like a belt and suspenders type approach, but they really only needed a special permit to alter and expand. So it's up to this board. If you want to amend the variance, we'll take the amendment to the variance. If you want to just give us a special permit, we'll take that. Either one I think works. Um, but I want to kind of explain why we're giving you like the, the either or situation. I think they gave, they got too much relief in 2007 when they didn't need that much. Um, I have all the plans loaded up per usual. And so again, I think I just wanna point out really quickly, you see the, the red square almost on top of the house that is all sitting above existing footprint. And then you can see on the, the red rectangle on the shed, there's a little jog in the existing shed shown in gray and they're filling that jog in as part of this um, rebuild. Here's the aerial view. GIS. So you have the typical alter expand requirements. You need to either find that there is no increase to the nonconformities. Again, we are within the exact same footprint. There will be additional mass within those setbacks, but we're not getting any closer to any property line. So that's up to you whether you find it to be an increase in the nonconforming nature of the property. If not, then the addition can be done uh, by right, or not by right, but by your decision. If you do find it increases, then you need to make sure that it's not going to be substantially more detrimental to the neighborhood than what is there currently. And so again, the encroachments stay the same. The height remains under 30 feet above average grade. Neighbors are separated by distance and uh, tree cover, and it's going to, everything's gonna match the architectural style of, of the existing house, both the addition and the shed. This also just shows you kind of the tree cover surrounding this property. And then if you, want to go and amend the variance, you'll need to find that a literal enforcement creates a hardship. Obviously, you enforce the setbacks. This is a, as I said, a negative building envelope. You can't build anything out there, let alone add to it. Um, the hardship relates to the shape of the lot. The lot was created in 1940, back when there wasn't all this minimum lot width, and so that's why it's very narrow. And granting the relief has to make sure it does not harm the public good or nullify the intent of the GZO. And you know, this can make a big deal of difference to the applicant and probably nobody else. No one's really gonna see it. And those who do are just gonna notice that the house looks a little nicer and a little more filled in. Um, and then the last one is to alter and expand the shed. It's the same analysis as the structure, the main structure. The increase to the nonconformity has to be not substantially more detrimental to the neighborhood than what presently exists. Again, we're just kind of filling in that missing piece of the front side of it changing the architectural design to make it look 
uh, more aesthetically pleasing and matched to the main structure. It's not getting any closer to the setback than the existing shed. And we also need a height permit to allow this to be 15 feet tall where 12 feet is allowed. It has to be consistent with neighborhood character. Again, as I've stressed, it's going to match the uh, architecture of the house and cannot cause obstruction of views, overshadowing, et cetera. As I showed you a few slides ago, there's a lot of tree cover between this and the neighboring properties. No one except for the applicants really gonna notice it on the day to day. Um, we also got neighborhood support. As you can see from the blue stars, the three nearest properties have all written in favor. That's five St. Louis Avenue, six St. Louis Avenue and 10 St. Louis Avenue. They're all in support and have wished uh, the applicant luck on this. And so with that, again, I'm asking for a special permit to alter and expand or in the alternative, an amendment to the existing variances. And on the shed, I'm looking for a special permit to alter and expand and a special permit to exceed maximum height, allowing 15 feet of height for the shed. Thank you very much. Would you be um, arguing there's not an increase in nonconformity? On the principal structure, we're staying in the footprint. We're not getting any closer to any property line. So if you ask the question, what's the you know, what's the setback violation now? It's the full violation, but, you know, is it getting any closer to a property line? No. So shed. the shed, I would say there is an increase because you're filling in some space. Okay. Thank you. Questions right now by the board? Just a comment. We typically, Joe, I think special permit, alternate expand when you're adding a second story uh, in, um, violated setback areas, we typically uh, expect a special permit for that. Agreed. Okay. <laughs> Any other questions? Let's take public testimony. Is there anyone in the audience that would like to speak in favor of the application or anyone online? Again, if you're in the audience, come forward, state your name and address and tell us what you'd like to say. If you're in online, Raise your hand on your device, or if you're on your phone, you dial star nine. Anyone to speak in favor? Seeing none, is there anyone that would wish, wish to speak in opposition to the application? Any opposition? I see none, no one come forward. I'll close public testimony. And we'll enter into a discussion, questions about, um, I think Michael's right, there's, and there's no objection on the shed, that it is a, there is an increase in nonconformity. I have no, personally, I think granting those special permits is probably better than playing with the variances. Um, I agree. Yeah, yeah I, I think for me, if Joel is comfortable uh, that it was a belt and suspenders variance and it really was not necessary at that time. Uh, and all he thinks he needs is a special permit. And I'm quite comfortable with the special permit and not playing with the variance. Well, let's do, uh, yeah, so we're going to head down hopefully the path of uh, alternate expand on the main structure, alternate expand on the shed, and a height exception for the shed. Those will be the three things we'll do. Any... I can make a motion if you want. And nobody else? Anything to say? Okay. Go ahead, Michael. Uh, petitioner Marina Bellier seeking special permit 1.9 and 2.43 to alter and expand a non conforming residence on a non conforming lot. Special permit 3.1.6 to exceed maximum height of accessory structure of the shed. Um, and we uh, and I'm going to leave the rest off because I don't think uh, he needs to amend the variance. And that would be at uh, 8 St. Louis Avenue. <clears throat> I would move approval uh, of the special permit uh, for the house for the second story addition to the house. Um, it is uh, increasing nonconformity, adding the second level. It's not substantially more detrimental to the neighborhood. I would essentially say the same for the special permit. For the shed, it is it, not a whole lot, but it is increase in nonconformity. It's not substantially more detrimental. Um, and the additional three feet, um, I would move approval, special permit to exceed the maximum allowable height of 12 feet there. 
Um, I think the neighbors have spoken with the three direct neighbors have spoken with their direct approval and there's been no opposition. So I'd move approval of all three special permits. This is made on three special permits. Second. Seconded by James. Roll call vote. Mr. Wilson? Yes. Mr. Gelati? Yes. Mr. Canavo? Yes, for all three. Mr. Nyman? Yes, for all three. Mr. Parisi? I also agree that it's um, not substantially more detrimental to the neighborhood, and I vote in favor. Heard our decisions favorable, and we'll appreciate a draft. Will do. Thank you. Okay. Our next public hearing is the application of 77 Bridge Street LLC seeking a special permit on 1.8 and 2.3.1 to convert a single family dwelling to a multi family three dwelling unit and variance 1.7 and 3.2.1 for front yard setback at 13 and 13 rear Hammond Street. Attorney Favaza. Thank you. Once again, for the record, Joel Favaza, Seaside Legal Solutions, 123 Main Street here in Gloucester. I will share my screen to bring up this presentation. I am here on behalf of 77 Bridge Street, LLC, the principal, Scott Sala, is right here. Scott actually grew up in this house at 13, the 13 R Hammond Street in Gloucester. And here we go. So the proposed work is to add two dwelling units to the existing single family structure. There'll be a small addition to the right side of the existing house that will allow the existing house to be split into two dwelling units that adds um, basically garages and a living room for each of the units. And then there'll be an addition in the rear and uh, a second driveway. And that's the only piece of relief that's not before this board. The second driveway requires site plan approval from the planning board. So if we're successful here, we have to go to the planning board and get that second driveway approved. And so uh, at the jump, I would say that any relief this board is inclined to get should be conditioned upon site plan approval being granted by the planning board. So uh, for background, we are in the R10 district. That is the medium high density residential district. We are on a conforming lot and there is currently a conforming single family use, but the structure is non-conforming. It currently encroaches into the front yard setback. Um, it's about 7.6 uh, feet away from the front property line and 20 feet is the requirement here. So the relief requested is a change of use special permit and um, a variance. And the reason why this is a variance, not a special permit to alter and expand is because we are changing the use of the house. If this was, for example, just gonna be an addition to add those garages and the deck to the single family, it would just be a special permit because it is a pre-existing non-conforming structure. However, when you change the use of a structure, um, the Gloucester zoning ordinance has been interpreted to require you to basically re-permit existing encroachments, which is why we need a variance for the front face of the house that's uh, been there since it was constructed. So I have all the plans loaded up per usual. So if anyone needs to refer back to those, we can flip back to them. Hey, hey Joel, just a quick yes. question, Michael Nyman. Um, if you were converting to a two family from a one family, would you still need the same variance? So, Traditionally, Gloucester has used the rule that if you're jumping from one use line to another, so okay. that would be from single family to conversion with exterior changes, you would still need it. Um, okay, the dimensional requirements, I would point out though, for a single, a two, and a three do not change. So it's the same front yard setback regardless of those three different types of unit count. Uh, the JS, as you can see, it's a fairly large lot, especially in comparison to the neighborhood. And this is the aerial view and a picture from the street and another from the driveway and from the rear. So to change the use, we have the 1.8.3 seven factor test to make sure that the proposed use is in harmony with the purpose and intent of the GZO and is not going to adversely affect the zoning district, neighborhood, or the city as to outweigh the benefits. Social, economic, and community needs served by proposal. This is gonna add two new dwelling units into Gloucester's housing stock. As you know, back in 2017, we were told we needed to add over 600 units of housing before 2022, and we added less than 300 in that time. And that includes the Dolben Apartments, which took up about 225 of that 300. Um, the R10 district is an appropriate area for allowable three-family use. It's, uh, it's actually called for in the description of the R10 district. 
Traffic flow and safety, there's gonna be limited impact on traffic flow and safety. There are two driveways to create extra parking. It meets the minimum requirement for 4.5 uh, compliance spaces with five garage spaces in total. And I'll talk more about that in a moment. Adequacy of utilities. The utilities are sufficient at locusts for proposed additional dwelling units, so no issue there. Neighborhood character and social structure. So there's no negative impact to the neighborhood character and social structure. This renovates an existing home. This adds much needed housing to East Gloucester. Again, these are gonna be um, you know, three bedroom units that would encourage family use. As uh, I remember from my time in the school committee, when we were closing the East Gloucester School, there were less than 70 children in the East Gloucester School who actually lived in East Gloucester because families have pretty much been priced out of living in East Gloucester. And so this will add two more um, three bedroom units in the East Gloucester area. There are multiple two and three bedroom, uh, three family structures, including a condominium complex in the surrounding neighborhood. And even one of the letters in opposition that you receive, um, you know, goes to contract, goes to, you know, combat this point, and then right after says, points out there's four, two families nearby and one, three family very close to this property. So even, even the opposition admits that there's, you know, a mix of uh, types of, of dwelling units out here. And the lot area is nearly three times what is required in the R10 for this number of uh, dwelling units. You need 2,000 square feet of lot area per dwelling unit. So for a three family, you need 6,000 square feet of lot area. This uh, property has over 17,000 square feet. So we're at 2.86 times the required lot area for three units. So um, if anything, this is one of the least dense uh, properties per, you know, what the, the, the table would have you do for three families. Quality of the natural environment. The uh, property's already developed. There will be some loss of yard area through the addition. Um, there's no wetland resource areas on site and the yard area has been preserved to the greatest extent possible. Again, um, the addition pokes out to the right a little bit and covers some existing driveway area, but there is still so much lot area on the property that will remain uncovered. For potential fiscal impact, this again is the win-win. The, the applicant obviously will be able to derive additional funds from the two new units, and it creates new growth tax revenue for the city of Gloucester, which is the only way to increase the levy without hitting that 2.5% ceiling every year. And the most recent factor test is the vulnerability of flooding and flood damage. The locus is around elevation 50, so it is not in a flood zone. So for the front yard variance, um, again, it uh, encroaches, the current house encroaches 12.5 feet into the required 20 uh, foot front yard, so 7.5 feet or 7 foot 6 inch off of the Hammond Street um, property line. The addition to the right side does not come any further toward the street. It maintains that line and actually maintains that line mostly for um, a lower level garage. It's kind of like um, it's partially buried as you look at it from the street and then an unenclosed deck above it. And um, Again, we're only doing this instead of a special permit to alter expand because of the change in the use. So as far as literal enforcement creating a hardship, again, this would require the applicant to remove 12 and a half feet of the existing house. They say, you know, chop the front off and I, I bet the structure probably couldn't handle that. So now you're talking about total demolition of a house that otherwise just needs renovation. Um, does that hardship relate to the soil shape or topography of the structure or landing question? Well, yeah, the, the lot and the building are where they are and where they have been for uh, decades, if not a century. There's also a lot of ledge in the rear of the lot. So the idea of even if money wasn't a factor and you could just demolish this house and push it all back, you're running into even more ledge than the proposed um, addition would, and that's going to create another financial hardship. So it would be arguing that even under a total reconstruction, you'd still want to be closer to the street. And you go, okay, well, if we let the house stay close to the street, are you going to harm the public good or nullify the intent of the ordinance? Again, it allows an existing structure to remain where it is. Um, most of the addition is the unenclosed deck or the lower garage. The actual enclosed portion is 15 feet from the property line, the first level. So the habitable enclosed space is 15 feet back instead of the 7.5 feet that the old house is at. Um, and it also matches the location of other structures on the street. If you go on Hammond Street, all the houses are tucked up much closer than 20 feet to the property line. If you look in the bottom right hand corner, you'll see the blue line is the existing front face of the house. The orange line would be the, um, the garage and deck carrying that 
line and the green line shows you the uh, enclosed space that is pushed further back from the street than the existing house. So we also had some neighborhood concerns and I wanna go through those real quickly. So one was um, about parking. And so I wanna remind the board that the zoning ordinance tells you what adequate parking is. And it says that if you have four and a half spaces for a three family in the R10 district, you have enough parking. Um, we have a two car garage for units one and two, and we have a single car garage for unit three. So that meets the requirement. There are five compliant spaces, but I'm gonna show you how you can actually hold 14 cars on this site. So here's a site plan. You can throw one in unit three's garage, and then two, three, four in the driveway behind it. You got five and six in unit two's garage, seven and eight in unit one's garage. Then you get nine and 10 behind unit two's garage door, 11 and 12 behind unit one's garage door. And for good measure, you can get 13 and 14 blocking them in. So if there's ever a snow emergency, a graduation party, something where there's a you know, lot of guests coming to this property, this would be 14 off street parking spaces Again, they're not compliant. It requires people moving cars around, but the standard is five compliant spaces. We have that um, and more. And during again, a snow emergency, large event, you can get 14 cars off the street and onto this property. Um, another concern was about noise coming from the unenclosed porches. So um, the deck on the front of unit one is about 50 feet from the house across the street about 60 feet from the house to the southwest. If you're facing the house, it'd be to the right. Unit two's deck is dimensionally compliant and is over 60 feet from the house to the northeast, which would be the house to the left as you look at it. Um, and unit three's deck is fully dimensionally compliant and is over 120 feet from the house to the south. So I want to remind the board, we are in the medium high density residential district. And the idea that an unenclosed deck between 50 and 120 feet away from the nearest houses would somehow be too dense or too much congestion, I think is you know, not really in line with what this R10 district is designed to have. It's medium high density residential um, development here. And I also wanna point out again, as I mentioned earlier, that right there in the definition talks about where appropriate two family and multifamily development is encouraged in the R10 district. And as for where appropriate, I don't think it gets much more appropriate than a uh, almost three times larger lot than is necessary with way more parking than is required. And then one of the other uh, complaints was about height. Again, the calculations are in the plan set. The highest part of the highest roof line is not more than 30 feet above average grade. So the height is compliant. So again, the zoning ordinance tells you what acceptable height is and we have stayed under that threshold. So um, to call this building too tall would be unfair and would be you know, directly contrary to what the ordinance itself says. Um, the last thing I will mention is that going back to the change of use, there have been very few changes to the zoning ordinance in the last few years or so. A lot were proposed and a lot were knocked down. One of the ones that got through was to make it easier to build three families in the R10 district. This used to be a city council process and the city council made it one-stop shopping under a very under a lower special permit threshold of the zoning board. And they also used to have increased setbacks and lot area requirements for a three family. And the city council did away with all of that and said, we're gonna treat three families, like two families and one families going forward to try and encourage this type of development. And so that's enabled people like my client to come forward and say, hey, we can help with this housing shortage. We have a very large lot. We have plenty of space for parking and we have plenty of room to build these additions to add these extra dwelling units. So we're kind of right in line with what the city council has dictated should be done, uh, again, in the high me or medium high density residential district. So again, we're looking for a use permit and we're looking for a variance um, for the front yard setback. And I thank you again and I'll stop my sharing. Questions by the board? Okay, we'll have to open up to public testimony and ask anyone wishing to speak in favor of the application to please come forward. Anyone in favor or if you're on participating remotely, again, you hit your raise hand device or dial star nine if you're on a cell phone. 
Anyone wishing to speak in favor? Okay, seeing none. Anyone wishing to speak in opposition to the application? So we've got two hands up. Again, if you're in the audience, you've got to come forward and give your name and address and tell us what your objection is. And then we also have a couple people online that wish to speak. So I'll go take one of the online ones first. Hot, hot cell, could you bring in, please? If people are going to want to speak, you can come up and get in line, save some time. Ready? Yes. Oh, sorry, camera. Oh, can you see me? You can't see me. Okay. I can see your picture. We, we need oh. to give you a name and address for the record and tell us yeah. what your objection is. Yeah. Hi, I'm Leontine Hartzell. I live at 10 Hammond Street, across the street from 13, the proposed um, development. The one issue that has not been, well, there's several issues that have not been addressed, but the fact is, is that each of the three proposed new units are basically four bedroom units. There are three bedrooms each with a study downstairs, which could easily be a fourth bedroom. And so you're looking at the potential for 24 cars if each bedroom had two adults in it who have a car. And we don't know if the owner, when if he's given permission to do this, would be renting it out on a short-term basis. In the summer, you could possibly have 24 people rotating in and out of there with all those cars and um, the noise. And the other issue about um, the open porches is that Hammond Street is a steep hill and it's like an amphitheater with the noise. And so the noise is amplified. So with the distances that were noted uh, by the attorney, it's still creating a density of population density on a street where the houses are already close together um, that I, I believe the traffic, the noise, the um, amount of cars and extra parking is going to be a problem. The owner of 13 Hammond Street already um, reconstructed number nine, rebuilt number nine Hammond Street. And um, it's very close to the street and it's a very tall building and it's completely out of character with the neighborhood. I bought 10 Hammond Street nine years ago. And if I had known there was going to be, if there was a three family across the street, I would not have purchased it for what I purchased it for. Um, and I completely renovated the interior of my house without touching the exterior. Um, our neighborhood has a beautiful character and there's only one three family across the street from 13 Hammond that has been there a very long time. And the tenants on the first two levels have been there for over 20 years, as well as it used to be owner occupied. All the other, as I said in the letter that I wrote to you, all the other two families, the four other two families on the street are all owner occupied. And there are 12 single family houses that are um, the majority of them, like 90% of them are owner occupied. And so um, to put a three family on this street, where you have the possibility of having to blast because of ledge, the um, and the fact that if he is allowed to build as close to the street as the current house, but higher, you're going to have this structure that looms over the street, and um, Nine Hammond Street already does that, and it's it's a eyesore, and um, there's already extra. Um, visitors who come to Nine Hammond Street who don't have anywhere to park and they park illegally actually right on 13 Hammond Street's uh, sidewalk. So we've got we've already got a very dense neighborhood and my suggestion would be to um, go back to the drawing board and possibly put in a two family or renovate the single family that's there and sell it. The owner tried to sell it last year and obviously didn't have any success. So um, I believe that this would really, really be detrimental to the neighborhood. Um, and I've spoken to almost all of our neighbors and everyone's very concerned about the noise the of, of pe when people live there and the parking issue. And 
it being an eyesore and it'll be a little higher, but being too as close to the street as the proposal would really be a bad idea for this neighborhood. And it's going to lower our property values. And that's not a good thing. So I appreciate your time. Thank you for listening. Thank you. <clears throat> I want to remind everyone we're going to limit to about approximately three minutes apiece. And if we could not um, say the same things over and try to focus on the zoning issue, you know, whether somebody tried to sell a house a year ago or not is irrelevant to our discussion. So let's try to try to stay on target. Really? Um, next up uh, was up first was online. Melly Pionka, I'm not sure. And that's the uh, only other one with a hand raised right now. And then we'll we'll go in order over here after. Hello? Yes. Ah, um, my name is Mary Ellen Lepianca. I live at 17 Hammond Street. Um, I'm, I'm opposed to the project um, because the street, um, I've been living here since uh, 1997, and the street has already become overdeveloped. Um, it's a fairly heavily trafficked, trafficked street. Uh, not not well maintained so far by the by the city as so far as I can tell, and um, the the um, the character of the neighborhood has already been altered. I hate to see it modified even further, uh, or or you know I might have been looking for a different a different place to be, um, and that little patch of of lawn is one of the few spaces on that street on this street that is not developed. And I would hate to see that lost. I'm also concerned about extra traffic and driving and um, the traffic and the parking. Um, I think that it, it's different. Um, this is just obviously an income property and uh, it's not as if the owner is gonna live there or that he's uh, trying to expand to accommodate his own family or anything. Um, and and you know, to me that matters. Um, so, uh, and I don't want to repeat what the previous speaker said, so I'll stop talking, but um, I just want to say that I, I am opposed to the development. Thank you. First person up in live here. Thank you. Yeah, because no one at home will hear you otherwise. Is it working now? Yeah, you gotta hold it close. Okay. My name is Carl Frank. I live at 15 Haskell Street, which is around the corner up the hill. And the, um, the point that I want to make is entirely factual. And I'll take less than a minute. Council, uh, who is your client? May I correct you? The client, according to the record, is a corporation. And the council represented this case. Yeah, that's irrelev. Who is, I, it says that the council is council for LLC, for an LLC. But council made the point that this lady grew up on the street. Sure, he, he kindly answered your question, which he didn't have to. It's irrelevant who owns the property. This is a zoning hearing. It doesn't matter who owns it, it, it how they own it, it what entity they own it in. There is there is a prejudice in favor of expand of granting grants to residents who are living in their own house. That's your opinion, not the opinion. It's my observation. Not to the opinion of the board. Thank you. We are not biased. I'm done. Thank you. Thank you. Next. We good? Right All right. Uh, my name's Tom Robinson Cox. I live at uh, Five Haskell Court. 
um, I'm in a butter to the butter. Um, I think Mr. Fafaza made a very good presentation uh, as far as it went. Uh, I think that he failed to demonstrate that there with the existing building is a financial hardship to the owner. Um, I can recognize that somebody who owns- It's not in our purview. It says right here, standard to be applied. Little, literal enforcement of the provisions of this ordinance would involve substantial hardship to the applicant, financial or otherwise. That's, this is, that's related to hardship of the land, property, topography. That's not related- He's, he's asking for a variance for a setback, which relates to the topography of the land. To land only, not, you're talking money. It's not- No, I'm saying this says I know right here, May 1.7, standard to be applied. Variances are to be granted only upon a written determination by the Zoning Board of Appeals that literal enforcement of the provisions of this ordinance would involve substantial hardship to the applicant, financial or otherwise. I'm quoting from your own statute. You don't understand what it means. It's to do with hardship of the hardship has to derive from the property not because somebody wants to make money okay the hardship the property if if following the ordinance not granting the variance would make it unrealistically expensive for the person to have a right to live in their home and expand it which is granted by the state of massachusetts that's what they're talking about. They're not talking about okay. the guy maximizing profit. Okay, I will grant you that. Forget the profit motive. But what you just said, he is certainly entitled to live in a single family house and improve it and does not require a variance to do that because he because the property is a is a legal nonconforming use. In the state of Massachusetts as a single family, as a three family, it is not. When zoning came in. It made over 75% of the homes in Gloucester non-conforming. And the and, but they're legal. At the time, in Chapter 42 of the state laws, general laws, made the provision to allow people to get a special permit to alter and expand a non-conforming structure on a non-conforming lot so that they can expand and use their property the way they wish to. I, I, are, are, so you're, so you're, willing to, you're real, willing to ignore the standards to be applied. These things for a long, long time. Well, I've been a real estate professional myself for a long, long time. Well, I'm not a real estate professional. Well, there's a difference between you and me. I'm a zoning professional. Okay, well, it says right here that it should, it would involve substantial hardship to the applicant, financial or otherwise. The only reason he will uh, that he needs this variance is to change the use from a single family to a three family. Right. And the, his attorney, his attorney said specifically, he will benefit from the rents derived therefrom. He said the city fin benefit from. No, he said he will develop. I know what he said, he said both. Now, can we stick? Bingo, he said both. My objection is that he has not demonstrated a financial hardship to use the building as it exists. And therefore, a variance is not required. He's not required to show a financial hardship. He is. His property. He is required to show a substantial hardship, financial or otherwise, to convert this from a single family to a three family. It's so so in your zoning ordinance. Hey, Joe, I think we're, I think Tom is repeating and you're repeating. Uh, so I'm hopefully we can't. Because he, he refuses to acknowledge the law. So hopefully we don't continue to repeat the same things being said, Tom, respectfully, okay. please. Okay. I wish to be respected too and not be told that I'm not, that I, that I'm, that I'm wrong <clears throat> because I know I'm right. Thank you for your understanding, but I do object to your interpretation of the law. Tom, you've told us three times. We got it, man. Honest. We got it. I'm not telling you any, I'm not making any decision yet. Right. I was just trying to advise you when and you- And the other criteria, which others have brought up, and I'll just only mention briefly in passing, it will not generally affect the rest of the neighborhood. 
will then without nullifying or substantially derogating from the intent or purpose of the ordinance aren't the character of the neighborhood. And by increasing the density in that particular street, you are adversely affecting the character of the neighborhood. I rest my case. Thank you. Thank you. Next, please. Hello. Hi, uh, my name is Matt Service. I'm a resident at 3 Haskell Court. Uh, I object to this uh, zoning uh, variance on uh, the basis of uh, increased noise due to distance from the street. Uh, I think that's going to amplify traffic uh, for all the people in the neighborhood. Uh, I don't believe that uh, the project matches the character of the neighborhood. Uh, that's been said previously, so I won't repeat that. Uh, and lastly, uh, the height increase for the property is going to impact my neighbor's views. So I uh, object on that basis as well. Thank you. Thank you. Next, please. We do have one more in line that we'll get to. Jack McKinnon, one Blake Court, lived there 38 years of 400 feet from the proposed uh, structures. Uh, traffic, density, setbacks uh, is totally incongruent to the neighborhood. It would be, uh, I'm all for somebody improving their property, creating more space, but with the required uh, square footage area, uh, you might say, uh, Aerial rights, it's completely incongruent to the neighborhood. And you talk about 70 children going to East Gloucester. How about the older people, of which I'm one, living in the neighborhood? Going to get clipped by cars going up and down, heavy traffic. I rest my case. Thank you. John Lowe from 16 Hammond Street. I live directly across from the proposed units and I oppose it due to the fact that um, it's a one family house on a large lot and now they're gonna have three families living in that same lot, which is gonna be extremely small. The, uh, I'm gonna have to look out of my house at this structure. It's, I just can't see how it can be any good to the neighborhood. It's a brand new structure. It's not, it's not a house that's being remodeled. It's gonna be brand new, basically, three of them. And I don't know many families with children that are gonna be able to afford a brand new condominium. And that's just the facts. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Sir? Frank Bellini, uh, 15 Hammond Street. I am the closest abutter uh, to this house. And uh, with apologies for speaking in opposition, Scott, I did have the uh, retaining wall fixed. Uh, so it wouldn't, my garage wouldn't end up in your lot. Anyway, um, besides the issues that have been raised, uh, I see four or five houses within several hundred feet that once this precedent is set, uh, could do the same thing with the motivation being selling for the highest price or garnishing the highest amount of rent. Um, I feel like the Marriott could move in next door to me and uh, no one might care. Um, if we are a medium to high density location right now, as learned counsel educated us about, and gee, I wish I could type half as fast as you talked, but I think I caught most of what you said. Um, do we go to a high density? And what does that take? And uh, where would the zoning board draw the line? Thank you. 
Yeah, with, with regard to the density of this project, he's, he's not exceeding the density. He has 17,000 square feet, he only needs 2,000 square feet for a lot. It isn't the zoning board's not making that, that's the city ordinance. And people can come up and fight the city ordinance to make those dimensions bigger and then we'll have no housing for any of our future kids or anything. But um, I'm just saying that's what, that's what the density is really not even in this chart, close. Anyway, anybody else? We do have one more online, Jane. M, bring her up. No, we got one online. Jane first. Yeah. Everyone has the equal right. Hi, uh, my name is Rob. Sir, there's a person online ahead of you. Jane M. Hello. Yes. Hi. Yes. Hello. This is Jane Militello, and I live at Seven Hammond Street, um, family home. Um, that was, my family lived here for over a hundred years. Uh, myself, um, not all that many. Um, it, the, again, there's a number of issues that have been raised. Um, one of the concerns we have on, uh, I heard the amphitheater called, we live on a hill. Uh, the noise um, reverberates throughout. Uh, there are three new decks being put on that are open. Um, they are facing directly towards my home. Um, and that there's a house in between the two of us um, that Scott, I think um, Scott owns that one as well. And, um, but the, all, all that noise is gonna head that way. Plus it's right on the street. Um, I have co real concerns about the parking. I know there's a lot of parking with people can park on top of each other, but it's not just the parking. It's when the, it's when the delivery trucks come. It's when the um, uh, you know, service people come. They park on the wrong side of the street, which is um, the, the same as the, um, 13. Uh, there's only parking on one side of the street on, on Hammond Street. And as it is, our road is well used well used up and down all day long, especially at, um, uh, at um, going to work time and coming back time. As far as any construction that's going on, well used that same street. Um, and I have noticed um, more than once that truck, that cars that are already in parking areas on the street, um, including um, Nine Hammond Street, they have company, they have people there and the cars are parked and they hang over on the sidewalk that means during snowstorms, that means during good weather, bad. And if you were walking by, you have to go out into the street. And that that counts for the um, school kids that are dropped off and picked up at the foot of the hill. Um, water is another huge issue out where we live right now. We have a real issue with water and it has to do with redirecting. So water is going to come down that hill and it comes down. It could be five feet wide coming down on that side of the street. Plus in the back, there's a spring and there's water that just comes right from Rocky Pasture Road all the way down. It's a real detriment to the neighborhood right now. I know that two neighbors have just invested, one invested 27,000, the other just invested 20,000 to help to take care of the water issue that's pouring into their basements and over their land. Um, we are part of that. Uh, we get some of that water into um, coming down into our yard as well because it's been redirected by people building out and clearing the land. Um, that's a big issue. And I'm real concerned if there's going to be any blasting in the ledge, um, my back my back wall is a ledge and it's the same ledge that's connected to 13 Hammond Street. I wanna know if there's gonna be any blasting there and what's, what are the rules and regulations around that? And as far as character for the neighborhood, I, you know, it's been a beautiful neighborhood, great character. And um, what I can see is that something that's going to look like a mini motel coming in. Um, so those are my big pro those are my biggest concerns and um, I'd like to know what the board can or will do about those. Thank you. Thank you. Sir. Hello. <clears throat> my name is Ron Guler. I live at 22 Hammond Street up the hill. Um, we have a I've known the Sala family my whole life, all the children, the parents, they're, they're a wonderful family. Um, although I, I do not agree with a three family, um, I'd like to see him go back to the drawing board for a two family. I know Glossa needs housing. I'm a real estate agent. I understand that. Um, Hammond Street is a tough street to park on. There's cars parked on both sides of the street, occasionally uh, 
down the street also. You have the tiki boat down the bottom of the street that advertises when they out to park on Hammond Street. You're backing hot cars up the street. Um, all those cars, my house, I have a one, one lane driveway. We park in tandem. Me and my wife are constantly moving cars. It's a pain. There's an awful lot of cars backing in and out in Jack. He has children across the street and the people that you have a lot of, there's a lot of traffic. I don't think it, I don't think a three fits the neighborhood. I think it's wrong. Um, I like Scott. I don't even want to look over at him right now because I care for him a lot, but I wish they'd go back to the drawing board and come up with a, a nice two um, that would work and still increase uh, housing. So thank you. Thank you. Or anyone else <coughs> wishing to speak in opposition? I don't see anyone on the line. Hearing none, we'll uh, close public testimony and we'll go to rebuttal by the applicant. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I will be as uh, brief as I can be. I'm just going to put my presentation back up so I can refer to a few uh, slides. So at first, as I um, had mentioned previously, a majority, not all, but a majority of the concerns were about things that are, you know, asked and answered by the GZO. Um, concerns, and some of it, frankly, I think, you know, this project might even be addressing some of the problems that were spoken about. So again, as to parking, the ordinance tells us we need five parking spaces. I've shown you five parking spaces. I've also shown you how to get another nine cars off the street. So the idea that right now there may be a problem with people when visiting 13 Hammond parking on the sidewalk, the creation of up to 14 parking spaces, I would assume, is going to make that less of a problem to the degree it is a problem currently. And regardless, the, the qualification, the requirement is five spaces, and those have been provided. Some people, again, have spoken about the height of the structure. At least one person was concerned about views being blocked. Again, views only come into consideration when there is a height permit being requested, when you exceed the maximum allowable height. This is not exceeding that. Views, et cetera, are not one of the criteria taken into account for a project like this. For the variance, the question of hardship and how it ties into a financial hardship, the issue here is that a three-family, a compliant, dimensionally compliant three-family would fit onto this lot, but it would require the demolition of the existing house and would also, as a, one neighbor is concerned about, require much more blasting. So that is a hardship relating to the existing shape and uh, location of the structure and a topographical geological hardship. So those are the hardships, not that it's, um, you know, a three family doesn't work because the lot's too small or a three family doesn't work because there's enough parking. It's that, yeah, a three family works on this property. Again, we need 6,000 square feet for three dwelling units. We have 2.8 times that amount. It's that to make a compliant three family, you're demolishing a house that does not need to be demolished and you're blasting way more ledge than needs to be blasted. So that's the hardship for allowing uh, a variance to be granted to keep the front face of the house where it is. And again, when we go back to the, um, I have to go through all these cars, hold on. <laughs> when we go back to the um, plan showing the uh, street view, I went too far, I'm so sorry. Uh, that's the lower portion of this plan. You'll see that the garage, which is matching the front of the house, is partially buried by the slope of the hill itself. So the, the new construction that is the same distance from the road as the main house is down here. Again, this new wall up here is 15 feet back, which is twice as far back as the front face of the house. And again, this extra little bit of height on the uh, peak of the roof it's a pitched roof pitching back from the road, so it's not gonna be a sheer wall at 30 feet above average grade at the road. It's pitching back away from the road to get to that increased height. So again, this, the tests before you are about not whether this is going to make everybody happy. This is not about whether the entire neighborhood supports this. This is about will the negatives that you may perceive from this to the degree that there are negatives do they outweigh the benefits of adding two units of housing 
and uh, you know, nine additional parking spaces from what's available right now and what's required going forward, is that outweighed by legitimate concerns that have been voiced to you tonight? If not, then we've met the test for both the variance and the special permits. Um, and I will leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you. Discussion by the board. Okay. I just think it's important to note that it's under 30 feet. <clears throat> so it's outside of our purview to talk about views. Um, <clears throat> as Attorney Favaza just pointed out, um, it's not a, we can't vote on what it looks like. I mean, they're within their right to build a box. This isn't a box. Um, but again, I can't even weigh in on what it looks like. It's not within our purview. Um. The, um, some of the points, and we, we, we see this at a lot of hearings, and um, the people's concern, blasting is not before us. We have no say in that. And there are laws in the city ordinances that regulate the, that, as one of the women, um, uh, Jane, M, she had questioned. Uh, that's all controlled by the DPW. Any new building has to absorb all its own water. So there's not gonna be any increased runoff. If anything, there's gonna be a decrease in runoff onto the street or to other people's properties because every part of a new building must uh, collect and deal with its own water. So uh, people don't know that and a lot of times they, they Try to raise these points. Um, people, when we talk about, well, go back to the drawing board. Well, go back to the drawing board, he can just tear the house down and build a three family in the middle of the lot, a big ugly thing, and there won't be much anyone can do about it. So I guess you look at what, what's, is this better, you know, than what he can legally do? And it's the biggest lot in the whole neighborhood. I mean, there were, it, it deserves to have a few, two or three families on it. It's 17,500 feet. So those were um, just some points that, that I made note of. Um, the, the parking, again, the view as James stated is not before us. You know, if you don't exceed the height, we have no say in whether it completely blocks your view unless they were trying to go too close to your property in need of relief or above the height. And neither of those things are happening in this scenario. So believe me, we listen to this and we do not set precedent. Every hearing is taken on its own merit. We've all been out there and made site visits at this property. Um, it won't regulate what gets done on a street over. There were, I didn't see many lots even close to the size of this one on Hammond Street. Um, and just some of the points I wanted to make. Any other member of the yeah, board? Yeah, yeah. I just have a comment about neighborhood character. <clears throat> um, I empathize with people who've been there for thirty or forty, fifty years. I think one lady grew up there for uh, you know family and stuff like that. Um, city council decided uh, that in in this area of the city uh, that three families are allowed. So. If there aren't any three families there now, I know there's one, but if there if there aren't any three families there now and city council has said they can be there, then the neighborhood character is gonna change. It's just that simple. Um, whether it's this house or some other house, that's not a reason to, you know, just grant something at this, you know, that's being requested, but the neighborhood character is gonna change. We've heard the same arguments in other parts of the city when people wanna bring in two families, when all the houses are single families. Um, and people are allowed to put two families in many of those areas of the city now, and people don't like it because they've never had any two families there. So totally understandable. I'm sure if I was living there, I might think the same, but it's not us who decided that three families can be in there. Um, it's our, it's up to us to decide if special permits and variances um, are reasonable uh, when they're being asked for in this area. I think I just want to make that clear that, that we're not the ones that are doing that. I would add the variance that's being requested isn't for any of the new part. It's just to maintain the house that's there now. There's the front yard violation. And rather than tell them tear it down and move it back eight, 12 and a half more feet, 
it, that's what they're asking for the variance for. Right, that's the hardship right there. Yeah. You're not going to tear down the structure just to meet that setback, you know, or at least make the argument that's that's the hardship. If you look at all the setbacks, um, everything's staying exactly the same. And I, you know, I sympathize with this neighborhood seeing that the traffic, you know, I, I went there today and I looked at it and I know I'm very familiar with that neighborhood. The, the sheer fact that this lot can provide all the required parking spaces, which is not even before us. I know that's one of the bigger concerns of the neighborhood is, you know, the abundance of cars overflowing into the sidewalk. That's just not the case here. And we can't just assume every bedroom is going to have a vehicle. I, I don't. You know, I don't know how how you can make that determination. So the fact that they have the the parking, uh, they're not exceeding the height, they're not increasing the setbacks. Um, you know, economically they're improving the housing stock. I think this was something that they thought carefully through. Uh, how can they get the best use out of this property? You know, respectfully, that's their property, and they're allowed to do it as a please. Um, so I, I know you hear the concerns of everyone else saying it's going to look like a motel. You know, from the street side looking in, it looks like a, a house with uh, a garage and a deck on the right going further back where it's not going to be seen from the street, in my opinion. Um, doesn't seem like it, it represents that type of character. And I, I think they did a good job designing the building to try to keep the character of the neighborhood within within that community. So, uh, you know, for those reasons, I can understand and see uh, why the owner went this way. And I, I do sympathize for the neighborhood. Uh, it's, it seems like it's one of those situations where you, you want to hear everybody's concerns. And I think the board did do that. Um, but the reality is, uh, I don't think they're asking for more than what the neighborhood is concerned about. And then into the um, to the decks, I know there's a lot of concern with noise. I, I mean, the decks are small. I'm looking at them. I mean, how many people could you fit comfortably? Three, four people? You know, it's not like they're going to have 20 people on this deck screaming. I mean, I'm not saying they could or they couldn't, but the reality or, or just trying to think like, hey, you know, the noise complaint, I'm just trying to address some of these issues on, on, on my end and how I perceive it. So I can understand your concern on that, but you know, a small deck like that, just to remind, I, I don't think it's going to be a jailbreaker for me. Uh, one more comment for me. Um, I specifically asked Joel about um, change in use <clears throat> with the variance. So I know that there is uh, some interest in the neighbors uh, that this would be a two family instead of a three family. I totally get it, totally hear it, um, but that wouldn't change um, the need for the variance. Um, so I don't, I don't see that the hardship is going to change one way or the other. Even if a two family is more desirable for some of the neighbors, we're faced with the same sort of decision making process uh, about whether to grant a variance or not, um, whether it's a two family or a three family. Yeah, they they can make the building just as big and just make it a two family. That's not, you know what I mean. So. Any anybody else want to add? Or are we ready? Okay. Right, Ron. I I had just a slight addition to the setback um, discussion that which is the principal request here. I when I did the site visit, I looked at all of the buildings uh, up and down the street. I think they were all within one or two feet of being the same setback. So to ask one person to move their house back is unreasonable. And it's not what we have typically done. We don't tell, we don't tell people to move their houses back. Um, so, you know, if that's the neighborhood standard and that's where it is now, we typically approve the variance. Okay, and I guess we'll be ready to go for a motion. I, I would make one more comment. The piece of this that's the conversion from one family to three family is a special permit. 
and the bar that they have to get up to, which is fairly easy, is will this project be substantially more detrimental to the neighborhood? And the neighborhood doesn't just mean Hammond Street, it means the zoning district in general. A lot of people used to get focused on two or three houses around a project. That's not what the definition of the neighborhood means. And, and so that's what we're judging. Is this substantially more detrimental? Is address the parking, the drainage is in our ordinance, the blasting's in our ordinance. It's not above the height. I, I don't see an argument other than just not liking it to say that it was more detriment, substantially more detrimental to the neighborhood than what presently exists. And I think that's what we always have to go back to when we're dealing with a special permit. And Joe, I think the special permit for use uh, is the seven factors, the 1.8.3. Yeah, which were addressed, yep. Yep. Okay, anyone uh, ready to make a motion? I will make the attempt. Go ahead. I move that Petitioner 77 Bridge Street LLC seeking a special permit 1.8 and 2.3.1 to convert a single family dwelling to a multi family three dwelling units and a variance 1.7 and 3.2.1 for a front yard setback at 13 13R Hammond Street uh, be approved in all parts. A motion made for a special permit and a variance. Need a second. second. Yeah, I would I would second that. Uh, and I think that the uh, factors for special use, uh, for a change of use, the seven factors that were listed out by Joel, I think uh, he adequately covered those. Uh, and I think he adequately made a case for uh, hardship for the variance. So I would uh, second special permits and variance. We have a motion made and seconded for a special permit, convert one, one to three, and a variance for front yard setback. Roll call vote. Mr. Wilson? Yes. Mr. Nyman? Yes, for both. Mr. Canavo? Yes. Mr. Gelati? Uh, for the reasons of which I were within my purview to vote on, um, I vote yes. Mr. Parisi? I also vote in favor. You've heard our decisions favorable. Put together a decision. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we have two more hearings. They're both regarding outdoor seating. The first is the petitioner, Lone, Lone Way Realty LLC, seeking a special permit 1.8 and 2.3.4, subsection 9, for outdoor seating and a special permit 1.10 and 4.1.2 to allow a lesser number of off-street parking spaces at 226 Washington Street. All right. For the record, my name is Joel Favaza. I'm an attorney at Seaside Legal Solutions, 123 Main Street. I'll get my screen share going for this application as people make their way out. So the property owner is Lomai Realty LLC. The applicant is a saltwater grill that is the tenant at the property. It's the existing restaurant. And uh, what they're looking to do is add a seasonal outdoor 24 seat dining area on the front left corner of the restaurant. And uh, this dining area has been here previously. It started when the relaxed uh, COVID pandemic regulations were in place. And this year when they went to set everything back up and go for their inspection, the special services department said, hey, what are these outside tables about? And they kind of said, well, we always do this. He goes, well, COVID's over. You need to get the, the real permit. So we're here to get the real permit. Um, and the licensing board has already permitted liquor service out in this area as they have for the years previous. We are in the EB district. Um, and we're basically, you know, we're the old friendlies. We know where we are, right? We are in a flood zone, but the structure and the proposed seating are outside the flood zone itself. And so we are looking for a change of use special permit, which allows for um, a restaurant with outdoor dining. And we need a special permit to reduce required parking. Now the re reduction is for 26 spaces. We're only deleting four spaces while the outdoor seating is in place. 
but the requirement, you know, the, the, basically the place is already 22 spaces short, believe it or not. Um, and so to go take four more away makes it 26 spaces short, and I'll go through that. So per usual, here are all the floor plans. You can see in the bottom left corner, the outdoor dining. There's the GIS of the property. And it's, uh, the property is kind of funny. You see, it actually surrounds the Remax building on all sides, which is, I haven't really seen before, but it was interesting to go through this one. And so here's a picture. And so we've got two standards. Um, it's 1.8.3 for the use, which is a seven factor test. So this serves a social economic need by allowing for an existing restaurant to continue servicing patrons outside. Um, it received great customer reviews for the outdoor seating in seasons past. And it's one of the draws that brings people to the saltwater grill. High flow and safety. Um, the dining area is outside the parking lot or the, or the, tra or the travel lanes rather. Um, it's gonna be protected by crash rated barriers. We're proposing that the barriers be approved by the building inspector, which we've done previously. Um, and although there's parking relief requested because this outdoor area has existed previous seasons, it's the proof's kind of in the pudding. There's never been a traffic issue or a parking issue at this property when the outdoor dining has been active before. And again, we're looking to, um, we are suggesting that any relief be conditioned the same way um, that you did drift a few years ago, that you did yellow on the water a few years ago, that the dining area be um, guarded by um, barriers to be approved by the building inspector. Just to give you a flavor for what we're likely to do here, it'll probably be Jersey barriers or like, or the water filled Jersey barriers. We're not looking to drive anything down into the actual parking lot itself. We wanna make sure that when the outdoor dining season is over, those parking spaces can be restored easily. So know that for other restaurants, um, people have done bollards or weighted planters, that sort of thing, they have some sort of post that would go down. These would most likely be Jersey barriers um, or water barriers. And again, we would happily conduct, you know, accept a condition that says the building inspector must deem them sufficient before they can begin using the outdoor space. Um, adequacy of utilities. You know, a little bit of extra lighting associated with this. Otherwise, it's the same show it has been. Neighborhood character and social structure. We're in the EB district. It's always been a restaurant my entire life. I'm not sure what it was before that, but it's been a restaurant for at least 30 years. And um, we are just trying to maintain a popular outdoor dining space that has been in use for several years now. And actually, although I don't think there were ever permitted friendlies, did have tables out there. I don't think they have table service, but you see it like to go ice cream, you go sit down out there also for what it's worth. Um, quality of the natural environment, it's a fully developed paved site, no change there. Fiscal impact, again, this helps um, Saltwater Grill take advantage of the busy season. This is one of the draws to the restaurant, the outdoor seating. And the city gets a piece of the pie. Every extra meal they sell to an outdoor patron gets a meals tax assessed to it. Vulnerability to flooding. So again, although the property is in the flood zone, this building is not, and this outdoor seating is not. And again, if there was ever an issue, it's just outdoor seating. Um, you know, it can be brought inside, it can be moved so it doesn't, you know, wash away if there's going to be some sort of king tide with a storm event this summer, right? You just move it up to the higher spot on the lot. So then for the parking special permit, again, you know, I don't know where Gloucester got its parking ordinance, but it's like, always to me, like they went to the Liberty Mall or 114 and that's where they decided how to set their numbers. So for this restaurant, um, Saltwater Grill would need 52 off-street parking spaces. And then Jasmine Garden needs another 37. So that'd be 89 total parking spaces. Right now there are 67. And again, functionally it's been fine and we imagine we'll continue to be fine, but per the ordinance it's 20, it will be 26 spaces deficient. So we would need a 26 space um, reduction. And the math there was we gave Jasmine Garden all of the spaces they need. So they said, okay, Jasmine needs 37. Let's assume all 37 are being used by Jasmine Garden. What does that leave left over? for saltwater grill, and then we went for the reduction there. Um, the condition there is you have to make a determination that the decreased number of spaces will be in harmony. And so again, um, even though it's a reduction of 26, it's really just a loss of four. It's been proven to work without a problem in previous years. And again, we're in this area where it's not like, um, there's a residential street behind it, but there's no real on-street parking. So in the event the parking lot was full, you probably find patrons going, well, I guess we're going somewhere else, they're full. It's not really a go park in front of someone else's house type situation and walk back over. You'd have to go around to the back. So we don't see this being something that's gonna pour into any residential neighborhoods if the, the lot is full, which historically it hasn't been. So again, the 
relief requested would be for a change of use to allow restaurant use and outdoor dining, and it would be a special permit to reduce parking for a reduction of 26 off-street parking spaces. And again, I would request or suggest you condition any relief on um, barriers being installed and approved by the building inspector prior to use of the outdoor dining area. Any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Otherwise, that one's that one. Okay. Any questions at this point by the board? Admin is still open. Well, it's, it can be. Yeah. It's a restaurant with seating. Well, even if they expanded into it, it would be the same parking for the same number yeah, of yeah, tables. Yeah. Yeah. So, any other questions at this point? Let's ask, take some public testimony. Anyone wishing to speak in favor of the application, please come forward. Anyone in favor or online? We have nobody left online. Seeing none, anyone in opposition to the application for outdoor dining? Any opposition? Come on ahead. Hi, Terry Sullivan. Uh, my wife and I own 224 Washington Street, which is a budding the subject property. And so um, I'm also a REMAX broker. So I get. So to, is that the old uh, realty building? And now it's a dentist or something? Uh, no. So it's right at, the, right at the Grand Circle. And so there's the subject property. And then next to it used to be the bank. There was a bank there. Then it was Carlson Real Estate that I purchased the building. Oh, back you have in, that piece. Okay. In the, in the same right. thing. Yeah. And, and so my, my parking, most of my parking, is abutting the subject property's parking for your discussion. And there's two lines of, of, of parking spaces. So I think it's like, I think it's seven. There's seven on either side or eight on either side, wherever it is. And so most of the time, there's an overflow at the restaurant and they park in our spots. And it builds up to a crescendo as the season goes on. No, no complaints against the restaurant. It does a great job. They have good food I'm happy with. Uh, but it's just absorbing our parking spots. So I have two tenants in my building now. I have the REMAX tenant, and I have a law firm. And so I do get feedback on a regular basis that we can't park in the parking spot because there's other people parking there. Now, whether it's restaurant parking, I can't tell you that. But I'd like to see if we could work out something where there's some effort made on the part of the restaurant to better communicate to their patrons not to park in that first row, because that actually is, those are my parking spots. Those are on your property? Yes. So they're not in the count that we're dealing with. It's what? We're, they're not in the count of spaces that exist. No. For the. So uh, they're using the overflow. So they are parking in my parking. And it's all about how far do you want to walk to go eat at the restaurant. Oh, yeah. So as opposed to walking around the corner, they just park in my spots. And there are days I pull in and I can't park there. So, uh, And I wind up driving around the corner myself, <laughs> which seems you know, not not beneficial to me at all. So all your all parking's all. primarily for the employees? So it's, it, it's the patrons and the employees that work both in the uh, law firm and at Remax. And so I, th I think there's only, I don't, I'd have to count them again, seven or eight spaces right along that line. But there's not a day that goes by there isn't one or two or five or eight cars or seven cars parked in that area. So I did talk to the proprietor a little while ago down at the restaurant to see, gee, if you could you know, be a little more cooperative and help help me out here. Um, and I'm sure there's a, a solution. Yeah, hey, have them towed. After three, no one will park there again. It's, it's yeah, right. <laughs> I, are the uh, are your spaces marked as uh, these not. are for the exclusive use of Remax and Ella Law Firm X? It, it's not. So they're just line parking spots. So there's no practical place to put a sign because I have to plow that during the winter time. So I'd, I'd be drawing, I'd be riding over the sign, or people would hit the sign. I could make it different colored lines. Um, Paint the message in the lot, in the space. I could do that. Then you could tell. Them. Okay, so, we'll, okay. We'll, we'll take that into account. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Anyone else? Uh, no, we'll close it. Rebuttal. 
to address that concern, I'd be willing to suggest a condition that um, the applicant for this project um, pay to have reserved painted in the, the seven or eight spots that are on the neighbor's property to make sure that you know it's clear to everyone pulling in these are reserved spaces and not just general parking spaces. Okay, good. We like compromise. Doesn't always happen, but we'll take it. Well, I will say another comment on one thing. Now that we're going to be permanently permitting a lot of these outdoor dining, and I know we're going to have a lot of them to here, I felt that one of the board's responsibilities is traffic and safety. It's clearly in the ordinance for the outdoor dining. And I know we've kind of in the past have just said, well, uh, what the build, if the building inspector says it's okay. And I'd like, and I've, I've told some applicants, and I'd like to see us be more forceful in one of two ways. Either we should require exactly what's going in there and only permit it based on what we think is right, or if we still continue to say, all right, we're going to let the building inspector decide if it's safe enough. To be honest, I'm not, we have a new building inspector, which is fine, but in the past, projects have been done not to our satisfaction and they're still unsafe today. So I want to figure out a way, and if it's just saying, okay, we're going to let the building commissioner say it's okay when he issues the permit, but I will say publicly that we, any pushback or appeal of his decision, we're going to support him. So it's going to, either way, I mean, is that our approach, or are we saying we want to detail now up front what they're going to do for safety? I'm asking you guys. I'm, I'm thinking they should provide that information up, up front for the most part. I mean, it, it's just it's a matter of public safety. That's all. You know, every, like you said, that been friendlies. The curb is very short there. And this isn't just this place. This is for any restaurant, you know, beyond this date. Um, so traffic flow and safety is a real thing. And I think providing the right uh barriers that the board seems fit and you know collaborating with the building commission uh is something our uh, responsibility i mean i think what was presented to us the the uh the ballot you know the concrete dividers whether they were water filled or, or concrete um would satisfy me to issue this permit right um but we've had ones where i've actually witnessed cars push the wooden barriers Right. Into the place where the people are eating, right? And we—that's our—that when somebody gets killed, then it's up, yeah. You know, because we didn't—we didn't make it enough requirements. So, so Joe, I like the—I like the conversation. Uh, I'm actually not in Gloucester, but I've been in other communities. I'm just absolutely shocked when I drive by um, the lack of safety for those people sitting behind, you know, some uh, wooden fence or nothing. You know, come to a come to an intersection, and you look. My gosh, if I lost my brakes, I'm going to kill ten people. They're in um, the news all the time. These things it's happen. awful. Yeah, I no, of course this happens. Yes. And there was a time when a lady drove out. That used to be the friendly takeout window, and the car drove right off it. And luckily, nobody was got hit. But there were people in line going to get ice creams, and yeah, it can happen. It can happen yep. easy. You know how somebody hits the wrong thing and. Yeah. People are living older and the reflexes aren't quite as Property good. adjuster. Come on, Joe. I, do, <laughs> I deal with it in my job. Nice yes. Chris says, according to Joe. So I, I think I would say we'd want it to state that that the, those kind of barriers are part of this project. All right. I, I'm just it? concerned about our expertise in defining what a adequate barrier is. If it I mean, walks it, like a duck and it talks like a duck, it's a duck. I mean, we all know a wooden fence is not an adequate to stop a motor vehicle. That's what we're talking about, motor vehicles. What do they do on any road to stop motor vehicles? They put the concrete. Jersey barriers. So we'll go with that. Okay. You know, they can decorate them any way they want. They can put plants on them. I hope they do. And I murals. Them, I hope they make them look great, but I think we should say that's going to be a requirement. Yeah. So if being so, we'll have a motion on this one. I can do that. Uh, petitioner uh, Lawnway Realty LLC seeking special permit 1.8, 2.3.4, parentheses nine for outside seating and a special permit 1.10 for 
4.1.2 to allow less a number of parking um, spaces at 226 Washington Street. Um, I think uh, Attorney Favaza uh, met the seven standards for the uh, outside seating um, permit. And uh, I think uh, the lesser number of parking spaces um, is reasonable. And I think a track record shows um, that it's adequate there. And I think the two conditions would be uh, conditioned the uh, this would be conditioned on uh, Jersey barriers being installed to protect the uh, seating area and that the applicant would pay to have the seven to eight parking spaces owned by the neighbor uh, to be painted for reserve spaces. Move approval for both. Second. Motion made and seconded um, for the uh, special permit with the guy with outdoor seating and to allow the lesser number of off-street parking spaces. Uh, Specifically I, 26, yeah. Yeah, I, I definitely support that. I've, I've seen it when those both were going full blast. If you've been around, it actually used to be three businesses. There was a Brooks drugstore in the middle of the two restaurants. So it's, it's been able to hold a lot of parking. There's a lot of parking down by the water on the right. Um, I, number wise, yeah, we're granting a variance, but I think it's adequate. So I would support that too. So we have a motion made and seconded. Roll call vote. And I will state I'm going to be stamping the plan that shows the Jersey barriers. That's going to be the approved plan. So that way they'll get put in. All ready? Mr. Nyman? Yes, for both special permits with the conditions. Mr. Gelati? Yes, for all with the condition. Mr. Canava? Yes. Mr. Wilson? Yes, with the conditions. Mr. Parisi? We also vote in favor. Good decisions. Positive. Thank you. All right. Our last hearing of the night is another outdoor dining. This is the petition of GX-PH3 LLC seeking a special permit under 1.8 and 2.3.4 subsection 9. Once again, for outdoor seating. At one Gloucester Crossing. I remind the board we heard this before when they weren't sure what was going to go in there, possibly a restaurant, but we did have a, we, there is a decision in the packet that we had written in the past, and my only comment up front, and I had expressed this to the applicant, that we want them to touch on more detail about the safety barriers and we'll make them part of our uh, going. So uh, go ahead, sir, you have the floor. Uh, thank you. Uh, my name is, uh, for the record, Tim Power, a civil engineer uh, representing the applicant. Uh, today, I was actually uh, part of the team who prepared the special permit uh, back in 2019. So they brought me back and to uh, re-up this one. So uh, as mentioned, yes. uh, my address for my company is actually uh, uh, 18 Glendale Road in Norwood, uh, Massachusetts. <clears throat> uh, so uh, as mentioned by the chair, we had an original permit for this. Um, and at the time, um, if you look back at some of the permits, we actually got two permits uh, for outdoor seating, uh, both for Starbucks and for this same space we're going to talk about tonight. Uh, the, um, after the permits were granted, we uh, uh, completed the construction on the shell building, uh, built out the concrete area as part of the sidewalk for use for the patio area. Uh, we just did not have a tenant identified, so they didn't put up the, uh, the perimeter fencing and barriers that were uh, anticipated at that time. Uh, then uh, with no tenant and COVID went on, took some time, the permit expired. So uh, here we are today, fast forward today. Uh, we have the exciting tenant who's moved in. I believe it's open Harbor 9 Golf, a golf simulator and uh, with a restaurant and bar uh, service as well. They're looking to utilize that patio area as, as we had uh, very similar to as we had originally presented. Uh, <clears throat> um, so it were, in essence, we're hoping to renew the permit uh, that we had. The uh, application we provided uh, uh, included a layout of the tenant's actual uh, patio. It's just slightly smaller than we anticipated in 2019. They were only showing occupancy of 10 people on that plan. Uh, the original permit was 36. Uh, it was a little bit wider, uh, 
original permit had a six foot band of sidewalk outside the patio so patrons could pass by. Uh, They're, um, I think, keeping at least 11 feet in the front and a little bit more on the side. <clears throat> um, uh, the original permit also, as mentioned by the chair a few times here now, talked about the safety barriers. Although we didn't include that, we had anticipated a similar condition. Uh, to get into a little more detail, what we're expecting, at, this is a permanent placement, so the Jersey barriers is probably inappropriate here, but we're proposed to do uh, steel bollards, a concrete set, uh, six feet apart in line with the posts for the fence uh, enclosure um, set into the concrete. Uh, around, very similar to what Starbucks has just down the end of the plaza. I do have some pictures here. I apologize, my my computer does not have the right wire to plug in. I'm happy to pass these around to the board if anyone needs to see them if they have not been to Starbucks <clears throat> uh, as an example of what we're looking to do. Uh, the last piece I did want to touch on, just in case someone picked up on it in our cover letter for the application, uh, we did have a little typo that talked about drive through and take out service uh, that is not intended for this restaurant uh, by any means. That was for the Starbucks application, so I apologize for that. This is just a, a sit-in restaurant, uh, perhaps with incidental takeout, but, um, but not a drive through and not heavy takeout use. Uh, I'll leave it there, happy to touch on any other aspects. Thank you. Rob, you're, you've seen the Starbucks, you're happy. That's a nice, they did a nice job on that. I have no problem with it. Okay, yeah, I mean, either or either way, you know, if you, you're, you're making something obviously better looking, and that's great. Um, and the ballots solve the safety issue, so we're, we're very good with that. Any uh, discussion by the board, questions or anything at this point? I think for you and me, Joe, less is more, right? I mean, we both voted for this thing back in 2019, and they don't, sure. they're only asking for 10 spaces this time instead of 36, so it's easy for uh, me. Easy one, yep. Okay, any, uh, we'll take public testimony just in case anyone wishes to speak in favor of the application, either in person or online, please come forward. Seeing none, is there anyone that wishes to speak in opposition to the application? Please come forward or raise your hand. Seeing none, we'll end public, the public hearing and we'll go to a motion if or unless there's more discussion by the board. I'd like to make a motion that petitioners who is GXPH3 LLC, who is seeking a special permit 1.8 and 2.3.4, parent 9, close parent for outside seating at 1 Gloucester Crossing Building C, Unit 335, be approved with the condition that specifications for permanent bollards be included going forward. Second. Motion made and seconded. Uh, roll call vote. Mr. Wilson? Yes. Mr. Gelati? Yes. Mr. Canavo? Yes. Nyman? Uh, yes, and I'm assuming that a similar um, uh, write up will be, uh, you know, compared to the last one, you know, citing the seven factors for 1.8.3. Yes. Mr. Percy? Yes. Congrats, decision's favorable. Did we write the decision the last time or did you folks? Uh, the, someone for the applicant had written it the last time. Someone for the applicant. Yeah. I thought so. We can, uh, it's easy enough if, if we, that's we, not available, we can amend this one. And we do have the, uh, uh, the original document. We can certainly provide it to you. That'd be great if it helps us out, get it done quicker. Yep, absolutely. Great, we appreciate that. Thank you. And you can forward it into the office and then she'll distribute it to us. Great. Thanks. Okay, that's it for the hearings tonight. Yeah, I have a question. Sure. Back on the, uh, which hearing were we at? 13 Hammond. Yep. Uh, can we actually, can we legally amend that? Or is that, are we done with that? Because Joel had suggested um, that that decision be conditioned upon that second driveway uh, being properly uh, permitted uh, through city council. And we did not condition that. That's planning board, right? Planning board, yeah. To answer that question, the condition would have been 
extra, the building inspector cannot issue a permit without site plan approval. So even though if it didn't make it into your decision tonight, if we go to apply for a building permit with just the zoning relief and no special permit or no site plan approval from the planning board, yeah. it will get denied. Gotcha. Yeah, they're going right. to have to get that anyway. Sounds good. Yep. Thank you. Good check. All right. Uh, welcome everyone back from the travels. Good to have a few bodies next to me. Just <laughs> Mike. Yeah, I don't know what. <laughs> um, other than that, anybody, anything else? So we do have a full docket on uh, June. I keep saying 9th, but it's 13th, I think. Or? 13th, correct. Um, so we'll probably have like six hearings. So everybody have packets here tonight. Don't forget to take them and study them intensely. And then June 27th, we already have a couple of things on that docket. So it'll be a busy June. we got a fiesta right in between then. We usually lose PETA to hangover. <laughs> Is he uh, walking the pole? Oh, he will be. I got it. Yeah, he will be. Um, so other than that, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Seconded. Roll call. You know, Michael, if you were here, we could just say all in favor. <laughs> I'll hey. show up one of these days. <laughs> Zinga. Mr. Gelati. Yes. Mr. Nyman. Yes. Mr. Canavo. Yes. Mr. Wilson. Yes. Mr. Parisa. Yes, we are officially adjourned. Thanks, everybody.